guys. Um, I don't know exactly how I have a longer time slot to make it worth your while. What we're talking about today is a brand new product set for Prism, um, which we hope will become the main entry point for the vast majority of the scientific community into the Prism target observation data center. And what we try and accomplish over the next half hour is to take you on a path through that analysis and pipeline that we put together that goes from the Prism target observation products that we're currently delivering to the PBS to these MTRARs that I need to describe. I'll show you what we're doing to the data and why to go from point A to point B. Uh, there's a bit of a preamble here at Prism. Um, the Prism team hosted a data users workshop right before LPSC back in March. Um, it was a half a day session. We had a long agenda for everybody out. This talk is one little piece. Uh, so one little piece of the uh, presentations that we did down at the workshop kind of condensed a little bit to try and get the time available. Um, the full background, well, full turn of one in prison data changes to the metric calibration, a whole lot of that is available at uh, those two links that are up on the screen. Um, so if uh, this talk piques your interest, you can get the full story uh, based on the workshop. And then, as I said, we're going to to walk through specific to the generation of MTRDR, which is a little bit of a reflight of uh, ID4 and ID Jacket. So what we currently deliver to the PDS, we'll get about the these products in just a second. We call them Target Reduced Data Records, uh, or TRR, Version Retreated Products. And these uh, accurately put the stuff to rating, so here in IRF. But these products include a number of idiosyncrasies. Some are unique to PRISM, some are typical of uh, imaging spectrometers, but all these different characteristics that we're going to get in just a moment make or at least complicate visualizing the information content in the observation uh, in the image queue, can even complicate comparing the spectrum with any given scene and much more comparing observations from, from, from different scenes together. Uh, the origins of some of these in the areas that are um, Idiosyncrasies come from lots of different places. Uh, Prism, as we see in the second, has two different detectors. So the full wavelength range goes from about 400 to about 4,000 nanometers. You can break it up right one microns. And uh, those, the, the split of the wavelength of the two products causes some difficulties for some specific kinds of analyses. The big one, and this is going to be the one that's going to be fun to talk about, is the gimbal motion. So, um, we're not familiar with how this takes target observation. The entire instrument is out of pivot. It pitches up, say, uh, a tile halfway between, uh, halfway across the fingers of the target. The entire instrument pitches up as spacecraft approaches the target and goes like this as it flies over the target. And the result is that you get a full range of complex of the atmosphere to and that necessary gimbal motion imparts all sorts of interesting characteristics into the data box when we're trying to take those up to. There's some minor, minor radiometric residuals, and then of course there's the atmosphere. The folks that work on Mercury and the Moon, you know how good you have it. That atmosphere on Mars, and we're going to do all sorts of damage to the portion of the signal in the prison data that sources the atmosphere, trying to get it out of the way. Uh, this is a user's guide to a prison vineyard data product. Go with that. Alright. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of just tweaking all the plots in this presentation. A little tour of what you're gonna see. There's a pulse color enhanced uh, RGB deposit. There's the median spectrum from the whole scene with a bit of an envelope to give you a sense of the distribution of the data. The three bands that go into the deposit the distribution are shown for those box plots. The horizontal lines here are the stretch limits on the deposit. And the wavelengths that live in the deposit are indicated down here. So, this little three panel rendering is one way that you can get a handle in kind of a snapshot of the information content of the prison. Um, this is a rendering of one of those currently delivered PDS products. And you can see some of the aspects that I was talking about. The long track gradients here, the right at the top and the bottom, um, that's the end of the motion. That's the changing of you know, the observation geometry for the atmosphere that puts that effect into the data. This is the linear side. This is the IR side. Um, now, the IR, which you typically see, uh, is a uh, torture. So, the, the main two microns here, two triples right there, there's some other minus of uh, relative minor atmosphere absorptions. Um, with respect to surface spectral variability, if you're interested in that wavelength range, we got to get that uh, straight signal out of the way. I'm not going to talk this slide. This is a list of everything I'm about to talk about in the factor later for reference. 
And this is the flow chart. And one of the reasons I'm going to show this right now is to just explain that these processes are categorized. We have uh, uh, different grade scales here the input data. What we call standard corrections, address uh, level zero photometry, and the speed of corrections, the speed of empirical corrections, which really make this whole process go. And then all sorts of spatial uh, transforms and the calculation of derivative products on the spectral data. Uh, the, the little green card files, these are the input, these are the current PBS delivery products, and this is the suite of uh, MTR and other related products that we're trying to get to. Um, this closure will show up as a little finder frame as we step through the rest of the presentation, so we can keep track of uh, what we're doing with the little when as we step through here. Uh, a little more background on prison data. Um, I explained the gimbal motion. Um, that results if you look in the middle here, a little bow tie shaped uh, footprint on the ground. This is again because of the change in path length to the surface as we're part of that. And there's a, in the rural community, um, not everybody realizes that prison data. When the gimbal was moving from its full range of motion, actually comes in 11 pieces, not just the central scan. We take five little snapshots coming in, so highly dimmed observations, and those are the blue outlines here, and those are the blue here, and five snapshots going out. So it's not just the central scan, it really gives the thing up and over way down track, a 60 degree gimbal angle. And that gives us an incredible range of both atmospheric path lines and uh, uh, phase angle. And gives you a really handle on the axis. When you take all those 11 pieces and splat them down on the page, this is the best attempt to show you when all 11 pieces of the typical when the camera was moving to its whole range of motion observation look like. Um, here are those little high beam UPFs, not so useful for surface science, but critical for surface atmosphere separation, and I'll expect you to go along with it. Uh, let's go jump drop into the actual processing. First thing you want to do is a very simple photometric correction. It's not complicated, um, but uh, Prism Data has an ancillary product called PDR for live data records, which include um, the uh, incidence angle of every pixel in the scene with respect to the mobile arrow. So when you take that incidence angle out of the arrows, you take the cosine of the latitude of data. It's very, very constant over a uh, prism observation. Uh, it takes a little bit of time, the sun moves a little bit, but it's very, very constant. So the effect is generally is very nearly just to change the overall uh, range of the uh, uh, cube. But one improvement we made, specifically the MGR pipeline, if you actually load up that incident sign of layer, it's not smooth. And it looks like this. It's, it's desperatized. And this is because we're pulling some of the best available MOLA experimental data that we've ever looked at, which runs out of about 16 pieces per degree. Um, so to make it absolutely sure that we're not injecting any of this non-realistic structure into our data in the pipeline, we're going to do a simple smoothing of this and then to get a uh, smooth build representation of the incident sign of variation that divide that out. Not a big deal. The effect uh, visually is indistinguishable. You see the small change in scale that I mentioned at the beginning. And there's the IR. And I'll step through that simple example because all the rest of these follow kind of the same process. There's a little header page which just says what we're going to do and why, and a single example, and then more detailed as we walk through. And the single scene, which I forgot to mention, is FRTC to C202, which is up in the middle of the fossil region. We're going to carry this example all the way through. So we have a simple photometric collection. What about the atmosphere? Um, if you're familiar with prison data, if you're familiar with the prison analysis toolkit, we'll come across the cap. Um, and for as long as I've been here, there's been some version of what we call the volcano scan atmosphere correction in the cap. It's come a long way. Uh, the most recent, recent releases of the cap include some significant changes to the underlying methodology of how the atmosphere correction is applied. Now, it's only applied to IR data. What I'm showing here. Uh, is the effects uh, of the correction. Here are the three bands in the composite are uh, being plucked out of the right in the middle of uh, the three absorptions that make up the CO2 triplet. That's why it looks so horrendous. But the point is that spectrally, um, in fact, Morgan's going to explain some of the details of this in the next talk. Um, spectrally, we've got really, really good at beating down the nefarious residuals that go along with this type of correction, which, truth be told, is a really gross approximation of the atmospheric behavior transfer. But we can make it work. And the goal here is to get to the suite of products that will enhance the ability to use um, surface uh, comparison to surface stuff that we are going to be on this one. One, uh, Frank is going to talk about all the details of uh, the volcanic correction. 
uh, and as applied to our example queue, uh, again, visually, because we're not plugging them into this case out of the gas band regions, it doesn't look like much of a change. Respectfully, uh, the spectral structure is attributable to atmospheric gas absorption is from the video. Uh, now, there is one uh, addition to the volcanic scan direction that right now is specific to the interior air pipeline. If you look really carefully, uh, there's a nasty residual that shows up spatially. You can see those green bands and green band of gear and again on the other side. Uh, this is a residual that's related to spectral the sky. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But in this context, it's related to the uh, the way the volcano scan is set up and the changes in the quality of the absorption sample cross track the prism. And this doesn't look necessarily so awful uh, in IOF space reflectance, but we start to try and parameterize the data. Uh, any of the spectral parameters that happen to be that happen to evolve to my ground region and it just totally spells out what this was like. And so into the pipeline we've injected uh, a procedure we actually put together as part of the crystal filter procedure, which I'm not going to talk about today. But it's essentially a procedure that is, uh, works really well in prison that it's going to seek and destroy uh, the long track column structure. So if there's any systematics in long track, um, they should be there uh, to the extent that that is something that can be identified statistically and finds it and wipes it out. Well, we're we'll doing the, the best job we can to maintain statistically supported cross track structure. Uh, and so you see that the application is uh, destroyed, it's called the ratio shift reaction procedure. They go from here, where there's some nasty residuals to the largely down the road. In parameter space, this is kind of as I was alluding to, this is an example of one of the parameters. I'll explain more about the parameters toward the end of the talk as long as I'm done with uh, This is one of the key parameters from prism with band depth of 1900 nanometers is indicative of water. Uh, it's an absorption you can get in the upper early H2O well, stuck in the middle structure. So, uh, hybrid mineralogy, alteration mineralogy, it's important to get this one right. And what we're seeing is that same residual is being propagated into some of the parameters, and you get this little step function. This is the worst one right here. This is a cross track profile, and this has the step function. Uh, Find this correction, and we're able to take that out and raise the vision the best we can. Okay, so we've done a simple metric correction, a simple but effective atmospheric correction. Let's talk about the gimbal. So spatially within the central scan, the gimbal imparts in these wavelengths and the long track gradients into the data. So you typically get brightening on the incoming and outgoing edges of the observation, and oftentimes you get wavelength dependent. If the, strength, the, the presence of absence of wavelength dependence is almost entirely a uh, function of what kind of phase angles you happen to be looking at, how dust in the atmosphere is. So that effect changes from scene to scene. Um, the empirical geometric normalization, which is the first of the empirical procedures I'm going to touch on, characterizes the geometric dependencies within the full 11 seconds of the prism observation, does its best to be a kind of agnostic way, characterize those effects and take them out of the data. This is a one off example of Lindell Crater, uh, which is up near Phoenix Landing site, and you can see the before and after here. For uh, in detail, this is this is the gory details. At the time I'm going to pass this just talk through it as I go through the next set of figures. This is what's actually happening under the hood. Uh, this is a representative um, single band risk image. If you pull up the DDR information, what we have is a map of, um, so I should just write, all the emission angle changes over the course of the observation. That's the gimbal. That's the cosine emission angle, which is the kind of more natural coordinate that we're talking about in the square pattern on this observation geometry. This is the map of the phase angle for this particular observation. If you were to take it and have been up in two dimensions, which is literally what's happening, cosine emission on the phase angle would be a binning map for the central scan of this dot like this. It's just like a checkerboard and suddenly a very slight pattern. Each one of those little boxes is a different geometric. Now, it's not shown here, but then it extends out into the ZPS that I mentioned. And it's absolutely critical um, to have this thing behave properly. Because after you do that bidding, you bid up the IMF data, IMF data, one band at a time, this wavelength and the band the first pass, the fitting, and the empirical function, not something that's actually related to atmospheric scattering, radio transfer, just a very simple uh, multi dimensional polynomial curve in that cosine emission phase on this space. And for this particular example, for band 63, which is the red channel on the composites, you can see you have a reasonable trend. And the data was the plus symbols to some of the uh, sampling variability indicator. Uh, and the model running right through that. 
So that is that empirical, abstract, and forward model that characterizes those geometric and mobile sciences. One more thing is, since it is an abstract model, we can't use this to correct it back to no atmosphere or no sky. But we can choose the point of reference within the scan, which we have, which we choose logically to be the uh, minimum mission angle when the angle is pointed straight down. We take this forward model and reference it back to that uh, reference point. The result of that is this uh, score model that's been given a normalized return reference. And we end up with correction curves that we take on the shapes of this. On this particular, particular observation, it doesn't a whole lot of wavelength dependence across the three bands that are in display. But you can see there's a blue curve and a green curve and a red curve. Those uh, profiles vertically, well, at least just a second, slice the lens of the cube um, that are literally divided back into that of red curve. The point of that is that actually the pixels that correspond to reference geometry aren't changing at all. This is off on the wings that have the most of the geometry because they're being yanked back down to that point of reference. Um, the effect of this is to take the physical data that has those inherent in the motion uh, artifacts and map it into this uh, synthetic kind of reference as though it were acquired without the end of the movie, as though it were acquired by a fishing room when they do that. And you can see from this scene, the effect is not to work the sale uh, and just to try and draw our lawyers based on color or overall redness. We make very different maps if we were trying to map out the, the color ages before and after we've taken out uh, this geometric analysis. The same thing applies to the IR data. Uh, we get some different shape curves, largely because aerosols have different effects as a function of wavelength. Uh, not as dramatic in the IR, typically, but important to get together. All right, expected smile is the next thing we're going to try to address. So we hear the smile correction. Um, back up the prism, as the, the radiometric calibration is very, very good. There is a small radiometric calibration residual that's related to spectral smile. And in fact, you can see, this is an observation from my uh, artist Alice, it's this uh, cross track here of my dependent gradients that show up in some of the data. Um, it's kind of blue green on this side and blue on this side. Um, the empirical smile correction works an awful lot like a geometric correction, except instead of picking things up as a function of geometry, we're picking things up as a function of the change in the center wavelength of the instrument samples as a function of cross product position, where we're going to support each other a second. This scene was so bad that it actually ran into one of our bounds, and so the correction was a little bit incomplete, but you can see the effect. And uh, the structure is consistent cross track. Uh, that doesn't change a long track that can be successfully removed or at least mitigated. This is a very uh, high capacity observation. Um, word about stuff with smile, these are plots that come from the prison CDRs. Um, and, the, and the smile in prison is not insignificant. That's the origin of some of, this, uh, some of the difficulty. On the linear detector, these are plots of relative center wavelength samples and sample as a function of cross track position. This horizontal line here represents the average step from one channel to another, one band to another, because it's about six and a half nanometers. When you get all the way off on the edge instead of the detector, the smile is so significant that you're actually looking at a wavelength that's equivalent to the center wavelength of the next channel down. And the IR, particularly the one wavelengths, can be even a little more focused. So this is why, fundamentally, how uh, we get these kind of effects, and it's why fundamentally up to this point, if you work with prison data, it's probably going to beat into your head. Uh, it's nice to try and work in color if possible. Uh, by addressing this particular issue in this MTR data data set, that requirement has been relaxed and it's still the best practice for the laboratory to uh, do more direct comparisons around the scene without worrying about changes in the instrument uh, characterization. Okay, again, this is all the scary words that you're going to bypass and just kind of talk through the pictures. Um, so the data that we end up according to the wavelength map, which we just lost a little bit a second ago, and you end up doing some bits that look like this. For this particular scene, this, this radiometric residual is also a scene in that time and time and time. So it's one of the connection you have in just a single reference uh, with which to take it out. In this particular scene, the media data that fits so uh, reasonable that you look at the scales that result in effectively a non correction. We're often the fourth class with one here. And again, these are the correction curves that have developed. Uh, from all the spinning we're talking about. Why, however, there's the red and the blue, where the 
channels that correspond to the red and blue channels and the deposits we've been showing. We don't have much of a correction, but green is just an awful, awful green. It's upwards of a 2% correction on the edge. The way we get to that curve is by fitting, again, the bend up, kind of the out of that waypoint against the intra band waypoint sampling variation that's as was illustrated on the previous slide. It's the same idea with the point of reference, so the way one of the reference, which happens to be the sweet spot, the way you smack and go to the detector. Uh, so we do a relative correction, and then we use correction curves, which bottom up the game of unity, so the very middle of the scene is not very moderated. We divide these correction curves out of data to remove the spectral small residual effects. Here's our same example in the IR. Um, the process kind of bounces like this. This is the input, this is a reference, which I didn't mention. We divide off long wavelength of evil information to prevent that excluding the correction. And once you do that, you can really see the effect spatially. It's the green green and green blue edging. This is after the correction in that normal space. When your reference back in, you can get that dial graph. This is the input. This is the output. These don't look that dramatic, but this is the kind of stuff that shows up when you start to do down and parameterization, which you want to remove from the data as well. Okay, here is the effect visually on the IR data. If you know what's there, you can see a little bit of the green color going away, but it's not as dramatic as in the ratio space. So, this, these next two slides, this is kind of the take home from these. So we have here uh, two observations that are, aren't extreme end numbers, but one on top of the spots, being here in IR, very, very boring, very, very short path point. You can see how small this little two absorption is there. One uh, that you guys probably recognize uh, down in the MSL field set, we've got a uh, much longer path plan, much larger down here in the range. Yeah, these are both then through at this point just through the simple photometric correction. When you run them both through all the stuff we just talked about, this is the result. And what I've done here is I've maintained this stretch in absolute sense from before and after. So we can just take these back and forth a little bit. This is what's on the PDS, this is what we want to be delivered after all our spectral processes. So as you can see, the dominant change visually is, of course, the, the effect of the, the angle, the vertical geometric polarization. The dominant change spectrally is the atmospheric correction we talked about in the IR data, of course. Um, but you can see those three points of view that are at the top, being able to compare spectral directly uh, from different points in the scene, and you can imagine how extending that to compare spectral directly in the scene would be much improved by taking all these instruments specifically to see this out of data. So we're nearly there. Uh, a few spatial considerations. I mentioned uh, that there's two detectors. It's really kind of two instruments. There's a beam splitter early in the optical path, and you can like those in different directions. Uh, what that means is that if you go to pixel the X1, Y, and Y, the mean data, the same pixel space in the IR data, it's not the same spot on the um, So you can resolve that by projecting the mode or precision cartography like the mode mode. Um, but it poses a difficulty if you want to look at a full range spot. So roughly 400 or roughly 4,000 nanometers, you have that breaking rate. So what we come up with is a way to use the DDR information, use the known um, ground latitude and longitude locations of every pixel, both in the mean and the IR data, and transform the media data in sensor space into the IR sensor space. And then we can stack the cubes up. And this not chart is actually a displacement map. Um, this is in the IR frame of reference, sensor space frame of reference, and it shows in a relative sense the distance to the nearest media pixel. So you get some patterns in here which are used to have the lumen motion, the fact that the, the two scouts of the detector aren't necessarily synchronized, that's the high frequency of lines, the changes in magnification. The point of all this is that we're able to do this kind of transform to the linear data. So on the left is after all the corrections, on the right it looks like it's identical, but it's actually been transformed and subsumed into a section and kind of dashed up on the inside. And the way to illustrate that, so I'm just going to blink these back and forth a little bit. So on the left is the linear and the native frames of reference, native, native sensor space. On the right is the linear data that mapped onto the IR. And if you can get around the huge contrast in your set, which makes it a hard to look at, you can see it's a much better aligned spatial. It is not perfect. Um, it's the nearest neighbor to sample, first of all, it's intentional, so no damage to the linear data at all in the process. Um, the two detectors have different sampling functions, they operate at different frame rates. Um, so, short of doing the kind of work that they will, the HGS, this is kind of the path of resistance to build a single cube, to build a single pixel, and get it to the wavelength range. 
And that is the last trip to get to here. Um, we're, we are intending to release two joint data products on the back. This is exactly what I described. This is a full range prison queue that's gone through all that you just described and stacked up and then build a single step from all the way through. This is in the album technique for the reference. We try out the bad bands and uh, not project it. And this is the actuality of our spectrum product. Um, so this is the kind of uh, product that, as I said at the outset, we hope to be the entry point into the prison target observation data set for the majority of people that uh, pin the PDS uh, and try to get into the prison analysis. Um, there's a discussion that I was hoping to get to talk about some of the parameters, and I'm just going to jump into this slide right here. One more trick up our sleeve is the summary parameter calculations are being, the process being completely low to so become aware of the hyperspectral sampling and the target observations. These are the couple of parameters. We talked about 1900, the saturation, 2210 is indicative of uh, aluminum silicates and some other interesting phrases. Despite all the noise filtering, despite all the work we've done on the data, um, we still get some pretty noisy parameterizations previously. By moving to a framework where it's able to take advantage of the perspective sampling for the same input data as the parameters that And the point of all this is that what we're trying to drive to is something called browser products. There's examples in here that we can look up later, which are combinations of multiple thematically related summary parameters combined as RGBs with visualization products, like this one, and this one, for example. Where each of the each of the color guns represents a different spectral character that is um, indicative of a particular mineralogy or at least uh, indicative of spectral structure. So this is how it's all from some particular questions. This is a before and after comparison. Um, this is if you go to the prison website right now, deep down in the data, and look for the Wiener RGB composite for observation C202, you're going to get it this figure. Literally, this is. Um, this has all sorts of issues. You can see the smile effect, you can see actually this is so this is so old at this point that it's the previous version of calibration. You can see the gimbal effects. And if you look at one of the browse products, the tall silicate browse products, you get this. And this particular browse product of combining um, spectral indices that parameterize the 1900 nanometer band depth uh, for a uh, lot of mineral structure, a couple of data and box of functions. This is a before and this is the after. This is what the indicative of the kinds of products that we hope to be and intend to be delivering soon to the PDS. It's indicative of the kind of products that we hope to see show up down the road in January as being piloted in Google bars and everything else. Um, and this one doesn't have it before because it didn't exist. It was impossible to do. This is that joint product where in this composite we're pulling one of the RGB channels off the media detector and two of them off the IR detector. Absent that uh, special reconciliation, we couldn't even make this. Okay. Um, in conclusion, <laughs> this is where we stand. Uh, the MTRDR product suite, which we only kind of touched on right now, is still in going team review. We're lining up a PDS review right now, and we're going to actually have a day for that, but it is coming. I want to emphasize that in association with the workshop I mentioned at the outset, the, uh, the PDS was kind enough to host a few sweet, uh, a few sets of prototype product suites. Um, and so they're available through the ODP. The link here is a link to instructions on how to get them. Um, they're not the final, not the final versions of those products, but they're pretty darn close and pretty darn good. So an advanced peak at the MTR product suite is the best we can do right now. Thank you. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. This is fun silence. <laughs> okay, thank you. Good job, Frank.